Good afternoon and welcome to the second session of using technology and innovation in the six steps of the financial planning process. My name is Seema Naika and I am from the Financial Planning Institute and we are joined today by Francois Dutoy who needs very little introduction. He's been doing some phenomenal work for the financial planning industry via his platform Propulsion and will be moderating our session today. Joining us on this panel, we also have Amanda John, who is the IFA account manager and business coach at All Mutual. Russell Ho is also on this panel today, who is a certified financial planner. Russell prides himself by helping his clients hack finance gibberish to becoming financially savvy. We also have Louis van der Merwe, Louis a financial, certified financial planner, and he is the co-founder and director of WealthUp. A brief recap from our session, uh, uh, our first session rather, where we had a robust discussion on step one and two of the financial planning process, where we engaged on the importance of social branding as well as the use of technology to establish relationships with people before we meet them. We also discussed what should you be focusing on when establishing a relationship and how can you set yourself apart from everyone else. Is it appropriate to ask for information before establishing a relationship with a client? That's a question that we tackled in our first session. And how can you use technology and tools to enhance your value to your client? And we also tackle the importance of the why factor. So in today's session, we will be unpacking step three and four, where we will be discussing um, analyzing and evaluating, and as well as how to present your recommendations to your client. For FPI members, this session will earn you one verifiable general CPD hour once you've completed the assessment on the learning portal. And without further ado, Francois, over to you. Thank you very much, Sima. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to introduce everybody to you at all at once. Uh, it's awesome to be back and to be joined by these uh, phenomenal panelists as well. So really looking forward to getting to today's session with all of you. And uh, thank you for joining us on lunchtime. So I hope you have a proper lunch in front of you and that you will enjoy that. And uh, yeah, so don't worry, we're not going to share anything that uh, might cause you to to, to maybe just, uh, I don't know, like you would need the Heimlich maneuver, so we won't do that. All right, so uh, first let me uh, have the panelists introduce themselves to you just briefly. Maybe you missed the first session and, and you don't know exactly who is who. Uh, I know Sima, you, you did a very well job of introducing everybody and thank you for overviewing or, or reviewing what we talked about last time. Uh, Amanda, if you can just quickly just to introduce yourself as well and just position what it is that, that you do, then that'll be great. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hi, everybody. A very good afternoon. I also do hope everybody has a lunch in front of them. I won't be chowing while I'm talking, so that's fine. Um, like Seema said, I am the custodian of the IFA Association at Old Mutual, as well as a business coach. I work quite closely with first line managers within the business um, and, you know, the business consultants who support all our IFAs. And from time to time, I do get to work with the financial advisors as well. Um, I'm also on the board of the FPI. And in addition to that, I'm an author of some financial literacy work and really, really uh, a big advocate of the importance of financial literacy and, of course, financial planning in South Africa. Thanks, Francois. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome, and thank you for your time. Uh, Louis, over to you. Just a quick intro. Thank you, Francois. So, hi, everyone. I'm Louis van der Merwe. I'm based in Durbanville in Cape Town, where I'm involved in a financial planning practice with my business partner and our staff. So we get to interact with clients on a day-to-day -day level, trying to use technology, trying to use slightly more innovative ways to make financial planning better for clients so that they actually can get to implement their financial dreams and, and move closer to their ideal financial life. So thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Louis. And uh, then uh, Russell, good uh, afternoon to you. A quick introduction on your side. Thanks, Francha. Hello, everyone. It's Russell here. Russell, all, all the way from Port Elizabeth or Quebec. I hope I'm getting that right. Um, certified financial planner and financial coach for a lot of my clients, making financial advice easy. And um, also newly speaker trying to drive change and pioneer good financial advice in our industry as well. And I look forward to sharing with you all of you guys today as well. 
That's it. That's it. That's how you do it. Eh? You do it like brief and quick. <laughs> All right. So let's get let's get into this amazing uh, discussion. And uh, I want to start off. Um, uh, maybe Louis, I'm going to go to you. Um, I know I said to you, a man, I'm going to start with you, but I'm going to going to jump first to Louis. And if we talk about like the three steps of financial planning or the six steps, we are on step three. Step three is about analyzing and evaluating and, and really getting into the understanding of the information. Uh, when we gather information, it's important to have context and have that, but it doesn't mean that we've analyzed it. So in step three, when we start analyzing this, I mean, this is really where we use most of the technology. But my question to you is like, as part of step three, the analysis, is it really possible to one, engage the client during that and, uh, and the analysis process. And then secondly, can we make it interesting for them while we're busy doing that? That's a great question. So, you know, in the old days, we used to hide almost everything we did with the client, right? So you would have a discussion, we'd go back, we'd prepare this financial plan and then you know, present it. And the client didn't really know what happened. But more and more, we're starting to include clients and kind of, you know, show that black box that it's, number one, less daunting for clients and that also that they're on board with the changes that we'll be presenting. Because, you know, the process of presenting something, going back, that's really an iterative process. So nowadays, technology makes it so easy for us to show the impact of their financial decisions so that you know, you don't spend all of your time analyzing and presenting, but actually engaging the client. And it can be, you know, on a level that they want to maybe discuss their budget or the impact of, you know, a tax on retirement planning. You can kind of start pulling them in because we forget that at the end of the day, the client should take ownership of their money. You know, they can't outsource that responsibility of making financial decisions. We're merely there to help guide them and make better financial decisions, but we can't take that responsibility away from them. Yeah, it's it's absolutely. And I, I think what happens often is that we, we we get so busy into that part and we feel like everything we do is just about that. It's just for our knowledge and for, you know, that the client won't get most of these things, but we don't keep them up to like, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What are we working towards maybe in that sense as well? And I don't know, Russell, on, on your end, um, you know, I know you you love engaging with clients and that how are you making it interesting for clients while you're busy crunching the numbers? Yeah, thanks, Francois. So 100% agree with Louis. I think, you know, back in the old traditional sense of financial planning, and we were talking about this before we went live, is that we used to follow that framework to the T. And what we didn't realize is that when we come back and present to the client, we used to only do it as a once or event when it's supposed to be an ongoing process with the client and an ongoing coaching process with the client. So I think when it comes to the client now, and like we said, you know, um, since we have technology now and there's more transparency and all that, it's also about getting the client to buy in, saying, you know, giving them feedback and saying, look, this is what you've done to date, you know, and these are the lifestyle goals or the type of lifestyle that you're trying to go towards. And based on what, what I see in your portfolio and what you've done financially, you know, I'm giving you clarity now of like where you exactly are. And it's also trying to get the client to buy in, not just only from a financial sense, but from a behavior and good habit financial sense in that position. Because like Louis said as well, you know, we as financial planners are here to advise and coach and guide clients, but we're also not here to do all the work for them. You know, I like using the analogies that when I speak to clients is that, I'm helping you paddle in this boat towards your financial or your lifestyle decisions or your goals that you want to achieve. But if I'm the only one paddling, then the boat just doesn't go, go in circles. So I need you to work with me and tell me why is those goals important for you? What do you want to achieve? And, you know, work into a mutual beneficial partnership. Yeah, I almost I didn't unmute myself. <laughs> that um, yeah, absolutely. Amanda, you, on the other hand, um, I mean, like Louis is focused on his business and the way that he does things and he interacts with a lot of people. The same with Russell. They are very active uh, in their networks on LinkedIn and getting input and they take that and go and implement it in their businesses and see how it's working for their clients. You, on the other hand, have a, a bit of a, a, a special sort of like almost like I think you and I are very much on the, in, in, in the same space where we get to see 
like how many people are doing things differently. Mm -hmm. So in this instance, what have you seen maybe that, that people are doing really, really well, you know, when it comes to the analysis part, because it also feels to me like step three and step four are not really separate. They are really intertwined. And then we go back and forth as, as Louis and Russell also alluded to earlier. So what are some of the things that, that, that like some of your thoughts about this, but also what are you seeing in, in the industry, what, what guys and, and ladies are doing that are really working well? So there's a saying that, that goes, um, when the why is clear, the how takes care of itself. And I think um, that is so important because if you think about it, uh, during that um, client gathering, you know, um, conversation and really trying to get as much as you can from a client, it's really understanding why are these things important to the client, those specific and different things that are important. But when when an advisor really goes back to the office or puts off that, you know, laptop from, you know, a client engagement and starts to use things like financial needs analysis tools and budgeting tools and debt analysis tools and bond calculator type of tools to really understand what they're trying to assess. Says, I do find that a lot of advisors, when going back to a client to really engage on what have I found, you know, based on the analysis I've done, and how am I going to take you towards the goals that you want to achieve, as we already introduced Russell earlier about, you know, hacking the gibberish. I do find that um, people tend to focus on the terminology that they think a client is actually going to understand. But a lot of the times, people really just want to have a simple, make sense kind of a conversation. And I do find that a lot of the times that does impact a lot on the how, because when adv advisors generally have been doing what they've been doing for a very long time, and they're very used to the terminology that they use, they, they are used to the tools, they are used to the analysis terminology that they use, and the and the solutions that they try to put together for the for the client. So I think when discussing that how aspect on saying I've understood why this is important to you, but how am I going to do what I need to do to actually implement the solutions that I need to implement for you? I really, really think it's important for, for advisors to start having a very simple down to earth conversation that makes sense to the person that you are actually having that conversation with. So I think some of the things that I am finding is that advisors are really trying to find a lot more tools to use in that whole analysis. I'd like to hope that many people and everyone actually that's in advisory space is using using a financial needs analysis. But I think in addition to that, there's so many other tools. And I'm so happy that we're having this conversation because advisors more than anything are just sitting back saying, please give me more. Give me more that will make my ease of doing things in my business a lot easier, that will make me engage with my clients a lot easier and make sense to the clients and really land the message that I'm trying to get across to the to the client yeah and, and something that i'm definitely picking up on like over the like the previous session and the conversations we had the pre-session conversations we had about three weeks ago the conversations we had just before we went live is that engagement is sort of the golden thread that now goes through everything it's client mm -hmm. experience and engagement mm -hmm. but engagement means that you are actually involved and yet you you actively participate from both ends you can't you can't engage and the client sits back and just listen and say for i don't know you you know best so then they're not engaged that that is an absolute sort of clear indication uh, on, on on that part my question then is like if, if i think about engagement around like you know on, on the analysis part louis so is it then like how much of that analysis happens while you are sitting with a client like do you sit with a with a piece of technology or software with your laptop your tablet or over zoom or, or teams or whatever you're using and then doing that analysis while you're talking to the client that's an interesting one and i I, I, the way I want to answer is not going to be a cop out, but I think we need to customize it to meet the client where the client's at, right? So cli some clients might be ready to jump into a scenario planning tool and show them the impact of their decisions. Other clients might not be there yet, right? They might be really scared about do they have enough money to cover their income now that they're getting to retirement. And what we found within our business is that oftentimes we have kind of a gut feeling and so many times we're wrong, right? We think, oh, this client really didn't save enough or they didn't prepare well. 
But when you unpack their thinking and you understand you know, what the meaning is behind what they're trying to do, it makes so much sense. And oftentimes, you know, for what they're trying to accomplish, they're already on a really good path. Brett Davidson loves saying that you know, the job of a financial advisor is to show their clients that they're okay, and if they're not, to help them get there. So I would say don't use the tool as a crutch to say, oh, Mr. Client, the tool says that you need X amount of life cover. Instead, use the tool as a mechanism to show someone the impact of their trade-offs. Because the only thing financial planning is, is making trade-offs, right? Picking one route versus another and even doing nothing is also a trade-off. So, yeah. you know, the number one, meet the clients where they're at and then use it to rather display your thinking instead of overpowering them with information. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's not, yeah, I don't see it as a cop. I just say like, hey, because it does depend. It depends on, you know, how much have we educated the client or how much has the client educated themselves. So yeah. definitely not a case where you just want to jump in and say, this is how I do things. So it's so important to meet the client where the client is. I think that, that's such, such valuable advice, Louis. Um, and, and almost the perfect answer, I would say, <laughs> um, which, is, which is great. Um, Louis, Russell, sorry, from your perspective, I mean, what do you find? You, you tend to also work with a lot of younger clients. Um, you know, what do you, what do you do? Like, do you find that that's what they, what they want or what they like? Um, how do you approach that? Okay, great. Yeah, I think, you know, an idea actually or a thought came to mind while Louis was talking and I should have mentioned this in the beginning, but what I find, and I used to also make the mistake early in my career, is that, you know, with all the tools and our processes that we set up as financial planners, sometimes we tend to forget that we are tailor making the approaches or, you know, the appeal of those tools to us as financial planners and not the client. So what I always tell a lot of my colleagues or when people ask me, you know, about financial advice and things like that, is I would say as a first rule of thumb, always put yourself in the client shoe, you know, whether you're using a tool or any form of advice or process that you are doing with the client, you know, think from a client's perspective is like, you know, how would I find this if I was a client? Is it a bit overwhelming? Is it too much? Will I understand this? And that gives you a good, I would say, idea of like, if you're on the right path and if it's going to appeal more to clients especially now with us being, you know, more virtual and having more remote meetings, you find that, for, especially in my practice, I find I have to simplify uh, things for clients a lot more. So what's also very crucial that I forgot to mention earlier on as well is that what I do with clients, I actually explain the whole process, you know, when I meet them for the first time and sometimes I even send them a video intro before and off my smartphone through WhatsApp of like, you know, this is what are we going to chat about in our meeting, our virtual meeting. And in that meeting, when I meet with the client virtually, I explain, look, this is my advice process and how are we going to look at where you are financially. And speaking about tools, like what you mentioned, Francois, I think a lot of the times, and it's ironic because I actually did a similar talk for a compliance um, event, was that a lot of us as planners take risk insurance, for instance, we tell a client, okay, we've put all this data, and this is even pre-COVID how we used to do things, we've put all your data into this planning tool. You need three million rand life cover, you know, or you need six million rand life cover. And I tend to find that when I come across client portfolios where they have that, and I ask them, so what was the advice that was given to you and why do you have this amount of cover? They don't understand the need or the purpose of it. And we have to learn and understand as planners how to interpret that to the client. Okay. You know, it's not that you just have a shortfall of three or six million rand life cover. You know, you currently at this point in terms of what you saved up or what you have in insurance. And if something happens to you, this is how it's going to benefit your life. It's going to provide, you know, a 20,000 rand salary to take care of your wife and kids for the next five or 10 years. You know, or it's going to put your child through school. You have to put things in a client's perspective or in their language or terms so that they can understand, okay, why I have all these things in place, why I have this financial plan, am I on the right path, am I making progress? You know, and that's where we as planners are there for, is to give them that clarity around that. So I think that's very important from the beginning. And like Louis said as well, it's about giving clients clarity and helping them identify things or concerns that they maybe might not be aware of. Especially in today's age, a lot of clients we tend to find are starting out doing things by themselves and then eventually they do come to a planner because they know they're saving, they know they're investing for retirement, 
but they don't know if it's enough or if it's going to give the lifestyle that they're aiming for. And that's what we are there for. Yeah, and I, I sort of want to want to step on and, and, and almost move on and say, okay, um, again, so we've spoken about engagement and we've spoken about do we sit with the client and, and do analysis with them? Mm. Sometimes yes, mostly no, I would say. Um, but then also, like, like, what is most important here? Um, I don't know, Amanda, from, from your perspective, if you, if you were to think about like we're now busy with the analysis slash recommendation sort of phase of the six steps, you know, what is really important um, here? Is it, is it the actual technical analysis? You know, is it, is it just a small part of a bigger picture? Or like, like what do we always need to, to keep our eyes on in your, in your view that if, once we like into this phase, I almost want to say, of, of the six steps? Hmm. So I do believe that financial advisors and financial planners are probably the biggest missing piece of the puzzle in a client's financial journey. And when a client does find that big piece to a puzzle, you know, then it just makes sense. However, I do think there's so much work that goes into hoping and believing that the clients that you interact with and that you're on board will really choose you as that big piece of that puzzle. And once that is done, it's really all about trust. It's really all about a client entrusting their finances to you. Hence, I say it is quite a big piece of that puzzle, you know, because it's a lifetime journey. And um, I do think it's very important for advisors to see themselves as such. I think it's important for advisors to not only make it important to themselves and in the process that they follow, you know, and the proposition that they've shared with the client, that this analysis is quite a big part. Yes, it is. But helping a client understand, for example, that part of the analysis requires us, for example, to consolidate your financial plan. And I think Louis, sorry, um, Russell touched on that a bit in terms of why do you have all these policies? How did it come about that you've taken this little cover yet you've got this much liability or you or you've taken this much cover yet you actually don't have any assets or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think it's important to have discussions with clients that paint a good picture to them. Why is it important to consolidate? Why is it important for me to understand your cash flow? Why is it important for us to have sight, for example, of your of your property investment you know, strategies or whatever the case may be, because at the end of the day, it's about what's in what is important and is of interest to that client. And an advisor is really there to provide that guidance. An advisor is there to paddle with that client towards that particular destination. So I think it's really, really important that when we also talk about tools, we understand a financial needs analysis and the concepts that sit within, you know, a financial needs analysis and how you basically go out and translate all of those conversations from a needs analysis are basically supported by so many other things. And I think consolidation more than anything, a lot of the times is very, very important. I think all of us have heard so many times people saying, I either do want my eggs all in one basket or you know what, I actually don't want my eggs all in one basket. Just like an advisor can't be all things to all clients. I think it matters so much when a client makes a decision that this particular advisor that I work with, if I'm working with um, Russell, I've really bought into their proposition. What they do matches what I'm looking for in a financial advisor and the way they go about implementing this particular process, which doesn't only end after they've analyzed and implemented a particular you know, recommendation. It's an ongoing thing. Hence, things like consolidation are important. Hence, a budgeting exercise is important because it also changes all the time. And I think earlier, Francois, you emphasized the importance of engagement. Engagement is a part of that process because unless you are engaging with clients consistently, at most of the time, you really will not have an idea of what it is you need to do at which point in that financial planning journey of the client, because then you won't really have that information. So, um, yeah, I think it definitely does not stop just at the analysis. It's it's such an ongoing process all the time. Yeah. 
So I want to get into, you've mentioned the financial needs analysis quite a few times now. So, so let's get a little bit into, into that part of it. I mean, there's so many different software packages and things available. But before we delve into what you are each using and what you prefer and that kind of stuff and why you're using it, I want to ask the question to Louis. Louis, the, uh, we've been talking about like engagement and client experience and, and having conversations with clients that they can understand and follow and that they can actually be a part of and, and all of that. But then if I look at the analysis tools, does that then mean I also need a simple, high-level sort of, you know, analysis tool? Or do I still need a in-depth, more complex, depending on the type of client? I mean, let's just let's assume, let, let's just leave that out for a second. But do you as the financial advisor really need to be able to do a deep analysis of this? Or do you also only need a high-level analysis just so that the analysis is at the level of the discussion that you want to have with the client? That's a good question. I think your software should be able to expand to the type of conversation that you're having, right? So a good piece of software almost becomes invisible. If you need to have a technical discussion around someone's estate liquidity, you should be able to pull a piece of software out, right? Not necessarily your main provider, but you should be able to get to that answer relatively quickly, okay? And I think utilizing the tools as, as you become a kind of a master in utilizing them, you can select which tools is appropriate for that conversation. Sometimes a client might throw you a curveball, right? Um, most times, you know, we don't know what's going on in their lives often between those meetings. And coming into a meeting, you can be really well prepared but if someone has something specific on their mind, I think you should be able to address that because we forget that the meetings belong to the client. It is there for them to understand their finances better, to get an awareness of what's going on and to get clarity around the decisions that they need to make. And if you can then match that through a great discussion or utilizing a tool with your discussion and, and that helps the client to have some backing information that creates credibility, I think these things all play together. You can't have the one without the other, but you could probably still have a really good conversation without having any tools. So don't don't let the tool be a crutch. Yeah, you always have an exam pad, right? So, <laughs> so don't worry. Um, there's always pen and paper. Um, I want to ask, Louis, I want to stay with you. So, so what are some of the tools mm. that you are using in your practice uh, and for what do you use them? And remember, I'm not talking about on, we've already onboarded the client. We've yeah. already gathered the information. So we're not talking about that's already been done. So I want to know now the analysis needs to happen. Like what are some of the tools that you use mostly in your, in your practice today? So we've tried to keep it as visual as possible because most people absorb information through what they see. So, you know, that could be in, in the form of a slideshow. For us, Asset Map sits at the center of our financial planning tools because we can show the impact of a decision, right? So we can show someone's whole financial life, all the people that are important to them, the objectives that they're trying to reach in one central place. We can then bring in pieces of information like your tax tool, right, is really important in terms of showing what the impact of someone's income tax is or tools like Gravitas Tax, which allows us to do tax simulations around what the tax are going to be if someone retires or withdraws some of their money. Because the speed of engagement has increased massively, a client wants to know within, you know, within the same day, um, and we had this scenario earlier this week, someone that's, um, that has started building and they've started renovating their house without sorting out the finances, now the problem becomes urgent. We need access to money. What is the best place to get money from? What are the tax implications? And what are my retirement impact? What is the impact on my retirement goals? And if you can show that visually to someone to show them, well, actually, you need to put in another thousand rand a month for you to reach the same goal. And you can have access to your money with, with this amount of tax to be deducted. You give them the answers to be able to make those trade-offs. Not saying make the decision for them, but give them the tools so that they can make an informed decision. A lot of our clients can make those decisions without us, right? But the speed and being able to bounce ideas from someone and having a sounding board makes that really valuable. And those are the tools that we use kind of on an everyday basis. Yeah, awesome. Um, Russell, on your side, like what are the tools that, that uh, you use? 
Great. Um, yeah, so I was actually just thinking when you were talking about analyzing information, I think one part of that analyzing and information and giving feedback to clients that a lot of us forget that doesn't actually also involve tools is if you think about it, it's our basic general understand knowledge of financial terminology and, you know, products and so forth. Because think about it, what I tend to find a lot is whenever I have meetings with the clients, a lot of my feedback I give to them is like, okay, so this is what you have. Is it actually what you thought it was? Because I tend to find with a lot of clients, believe it or not, especially clients that a lot of us come across that have an existing portfolio, a lot of them, if they haven't really received any form of financial advice, you know, they understand what they have is usually different to what they were promised. You know, so I always say like the first step of also analyzing information and giving feedback to clients is kind of just giving further clarification and saying, you know, you've got X, Y, Z in your portfolio. Is this what, you know, you thought it was when you initially took it out? And is this exactly what you have been paying for to your understanding? So I think that's the first crucial part. Then when it comes to the tool side, um, just like what Lou was mentioned as well, you have to also see it from this point of like, when we do analysis and tools and planning to give clients feedback or answers on like where they are progressing towards their goals, you know, try and steer away from doing a 30 page PowerPoint presentation or, you know, 20 page plan that you're going to present to them, especially in a virtual space, you know, they eventually will lose, you know, uh, concentration and they'll get bored. And we should rather see that as also an opportunity of, okay, we can have more engagements with the client and rather break it up. So it's not so overwhelming. And with the tools, so for example, I also use SMAP because visually I love it because it simplifies everything for the client. And I think from a UN aspect, and that's what we should be striving for uh, with any financial planning tool that we use to give clients, I would say, you know, a certainty on where they are going towards their lifestyle goals is that it should be as simple as possible and show them from a UN point of view, okay, you know, what I'm doing now, am I actually progressing to my goal? Or if I'm not, how far am I along? You know, so with SMF, for example, I use that as well. I use that specifically because from a human point of view, if I was a client, the nice thing I love about it is the progress bar. So I can actually see, okay, if I actually contribute 500 rand or more towards my retirement or towards, you know, saving for this holiday, I'm making 5% progress towards that goal. I'm not just putting my money, believe it or not, into a box and I'm, you know, focusing on this graph that's going up and down, this investment graph that's going up and down. And I find clients love their progress, especially from a, even if you're working out on how they are paying off their debt or a debt repayment plan or a home repayment plan, clients love to see progress, you know? And I think sometimes we get too caught up trying to show them all the numbers, the graphs, you know, the projections and things like that. And eventually it just gets too overwhelming. It's greed for them. So I think try to keep it as simple as possible. And I also use, uh, you know, your text too, which is for simple, you know, questions when clients ask, you know, I want to do this withdrawal, how much capital gains tax am I going to pay? Or I'm planning to run the side hustle and it's going to bring me an additional side of income. You know, how much income tax am I going to pay as an individual? I think all those questions, you know, clients have a lot of questions and they most of them can handle their finances by themselves. But what clients are coming to us for is not mainly the tools, but mainly us as individuals, as a sounding board to say, you know, yes, you are thinking on the right path or no, you aren't. Or what you're thinking now about doing with your finances or your decisions are good, but it can be, you know, done this much better or improved if you go this route. You know, so that's what clients are coming to us for. And it's not so much of, us giving the answers or making the decisions for them. It's more about empowering them with basic finance know-how so that whatever big decision they're making in their lives, they can make an informed decision. And it's not just them thinking on that point because you know, I tend to find a lot of clients as well that come to me, they say like, yeah, I've been thinking about it, but I've had no one to bounce it off on. And I was unsure, you know, and that's what we did. We did to give them maturity and also say, look, it can be done better or these are the concerns we have. Roger. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed <laughs> pop up here in front of me, so I couldn't get to the screen. I'm sorry. The, um, yeah, so absolutely. And and um, one of the things that I'm really interested in, in learning and knowing is that, you know, what do we like? I hear what you're saying, but it, it's a lot about the output as well. Mm. If you want to make it visual, it's about the results. 
I'm also knowing like, like, because it seems now like it's always like people love asset mapping, which is a great product. And uh, yeah, some of you are using some of my things, but, but you know, is there anything else that, that Amanda, you see advisors are using as well with, with a lot of success? So a lot of the advisors that we work with are using Old Mutual's version of X Plan. And I think some of the things that stand out for me in that particular version of X Plan is definitely the automation more than anything. Because depending on what the advisors, I know we're talking a lot about the client's needs right now and assessing those needs, but it's also about being able to have the conversations with the advisors to really understand based on how they implement their processes and drive their proposition, what are some of the things that each of them in, 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 in their different pockets and their different practices and businesses actually need as part of automating certain aspects of the financial needs analysis, the implementation of the solution that they would like to drive with a particular client. And I think that ability to actually automate certain things based on the different advisor needs as well is very important. So currently in the business, that's some of the work that we've been doing quite a lot in the last three years or so. And um, what's what's important, and I know I'm slightly going back to step two here in terms of the information that we've gathered from a client and the things we've tried to understand about the client and analyzing those needs ends up being what actually should inform what it is that we do for that particular client. And I think Louis touched on this a bit in terms of, uh, you know, just having the ability to use your tool in such a manner that it helps you do what you need to do for that particular client. Because for the client tomorrow and the client next week, you're going to probably apply yourself very differently in that particular tool. So, for example, I'll make an example of things like, you know, the way you categorize your client in in that very same tool in the financial needs analysis tool it should still have the ability to help you find ways of categorizing the clients find ways of telling the tool itself what you want the tool to help you do and that's really automation at the end of the day so you want the information that you've shared with the tool to help you do what it needs what it needs to help you do to start driving other things almost in a futuristic approach in the sense that when you go back to that tool and you really analyze and understand your client pool, not just your specific client needs, but the client base that you have as an advisor, it should start informing you of things like how do you service the different categorization of your, of, of your clients, what it is you do at which point in a year who do you review when and how based on the information that you've got on all the different clients? So that's definitely some of the work that I've been seeing happening a lot is that advisors are really trying to find ways to say, no problem, let me use this tool. I like it. It works for me. But when I need the tool to do what for me, will I actually be able to do that? Again, like I'm saying, automation becomes very important there. And I think advisors starting to feel like the f &A tool that they use is starting to almost represent them quite a lot. It's starting to represent the process that they've said they follow and the proposition that they take out to their clients. Yeah, no, and I love what you're saying. And, and I do want to add as well, I think there's one thing that I pick up in the industry a lot, and, and I'll I'm, maybe can stand here and say this, is that, you you find that when people say oh this f and a tool is so difficult or it's do this or to that it's often also because a prerequisite for really using a, a tool well there are two the first thing is your own financial planning knowledge so that is absolutely critical um, and staying up to date with that knowledge is absolutely critical the second thing is to spend time with the tool that you want to use and you need to go and figure out how do i present this to my client so the one thing is the using and like where does all the information go and then a bigger part of it is now how do I start playing around with different scenarios and manipulating things and and showing what could be different outcomes and then usually and this is where, where we struggle a lot and I've always been very critical of most system providers in South Africa about this because the way that the report is generated it, it's not client friendly it's more feels like you're an, an accountant and then what do we do you go sit at the mug and bean at the table and then you start at the top of the page and you go down with the client and the next page and that's not engagement um, uh -huh. so you as the user and as the financial planner 
has the uh, responsibility to go and figure out how you use the output. What is that output telling you? How are you going to present that to the client? And how is that discussion going to go um, around that? So you have to build your own way of doing it around. The system is only a tool. It is not the solution. And, and I've said this many, many times. And, and this is the thing where we don't spend enough time on a system. And, and I love that Henry actually said there, the best tool is the one that you understand and can use effectively but you can only do that when you have knowledge and you spend time playing with the system it is the only the only way so uh and different people have different systems that appeal to them uh, and somebody wants everything in one place so that everything talks to one one another other people don't mind doing a little bit of extra work uh, to get things into multiple tools and those kind of things so it depends on what what you as the advisor want and what works for your clients definitely I do want to ask um, around, uh, you touched on, auto, or you mentioned the word automation a few times, Amanda. So I want to jump over to, to Russell and say, Russell, um, it's easy to automate step one and two, right? Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of that that we, can, that we can automate. But my question to you is, you know, have you been able to automate any part of step three and four? In other words, the analysis and the recommendation part. Has any of that... Is there anything you could automate? Yeah, so I think one thing you could also automate, which is actually part of that, like what Amanda was mentioned, and I actually got thinking about as well, is that with a lot of the tools, and again, like, you know, um, props to Henry for mentioning that note. Yes, it's all dependent on which tool you can use best and to do your job effectively and also interpret better to like your clients when you give them feedback. And one of the parts which you actually can also automate is, understanding certain client categories and which phases of their lives are they entering because most of them even though they are going to be tweaks and every client's different most of them are probably going to encounter the same challenges in those lifestyle phases you know whether it's retirement or just entering the job market and then coming back to automating i would say you know your our tools for step three and four more so what you can automate as well in, in terms of assessing financial information is that astute is quite good and we've spoken about this before where they've fully updated to accommodating you know the virtual working place where now you can send a one-time pin to a client to authorize to request or access all the information and that you can build in as an automation as part of you know explain the process to the client and gathering all the information and their data to give them feedback on everything so i would say astute is probably a good place in which you can automate that as well um, the second part I would say when it comes to like developing and presenting recommendations, I would say with a lot of it, and again, it's based on which tool you use, you can eventually, what I've done is develop templates of kind of boating with the SMF. Whereas when I start presenting to clients, most of the basic information or the presentation is already built in. So the only thing I have to add in or pull through from each client's SMF or their information is their specific portfolio and how it relates to which goals they're actually progressing towards. Other than that, I would say, look, I'll be honest, I haven't been able to automate much for step three or step four, aside from those areas, but I'm still busy looking into other other areas of improving automation as well. Yeah, awesome. Um, Louis, I want to like sort of hear if you've been able or do you have sort of the same things, but I also want to ask you about, you know, like, do you have your own custom reports or ways of showing clients the outcomes of the things that you've spoken about or is everything done on screen or like you know what is it that you that you mainly leave with clients or send to them after you've maybe uh, chatted to them um, you know in a, in a virtual manner like what does that look like do you have your own custom thing or do you use this the, the reports as they come out of the system or what do you what do you do so i'll touch on the automation part first I think the approach that we've taken is to use modular pieces of software, right? But with most of the modern pieces of software, they can start talking to each other through something called an API. So for instance, you can kick off the process to have someone fill in a form with some of the information and send that through to your CRM, send some of that information to Asset Map maybe populate some of that in an email and there could even be an email template that you've used before. As soon as you start doing the same thing twice, computers are typically really good at being able to automate that. And I would say if you think about the amount of time that you have to write the same email regarding maybe the tax tables, 
um, on withdrawals, right? Maybe it's a very specific piece of what you send to clients. We see that a lot in the employee benefit space. So we've built email templates that we can utilize. It pulls through the information that we already have on record and it saves us a lot of time having to think, have I covered all of the items? And you know, clients still have to experience it as, oh, they took the time to write this email for me. So whenever you look at automation, look at what's being produced and put yourself in the client's shoes, are they going to feel that this is just an automated email or is it going to have enough customization so that it still feels uh, human like, like Russell mentioned a couple of times? So that would be the, the one part. Regarding reports, I think you know it should be tied to what that client needs to see. So for a lot of providers like Asset Map, we use the standard reports, but you can select which parts you want to show them. Maybe you only want to show them a summary of all their beneficiaries and the amounts of money that they'll receive they should pass away. Another tool that works quite well is something called Pulse 360. And that allows you to build blocks with inside of a report. And it can pull information from the CRM system we use. It populates that into, you know, if you would imagine a meeting summary, it brings in those pieces and it gives a client a a record of what you discussed and maybe all of the technical pieces. Because what we find a lot is while we're talking to clients either virtually or on a phone call is you can hear they're jotting down some of the numbers that you're talking about or some of the pieces. And when you can say, you know what, let's just have this discussion and we'll send you in an email a summary of all the technical parts so that you can look at it on your own time and maybe discuss with the other decision makers in your life. It means that they're more present in that meeting. And it means that you know, they can understand what you're trying to say that much better. Because remember, for most of the clients, this information can be super overwhelming, right? They're not experts. They don't understand what asset allocation means or what the different tax tables are. So we need to show them the impact of their decisions through using the right reports. And um, sorry, my camera just uh, decided to die there um, and pass <laughs> that fine. through to, to the client. Yeah, awesome. Thank try you. And talk to that. No problem. Um, then, Amanda, uh, I mean, what are you seeing as well? Like, what is the approach that, that you think would make for what needs to maybe be in a report? Like, what are the things that we look at, um, you know, if you want to, if you want to, like, have something that makes sense to the client? I always say, you know, if you need to sit and explain something to a client, it's already too, too difficult or it's too technical. And uh, I saw there was a, 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 a Mark Thomas here said, that the reports look like a complicated bank statement you know, or a set of financial statements, uh, which it typically is because there's balance sheets and things in there. But but I, that's what I also find. It, it's just, you know, and you don't understand the wording that's on there and it's a step-by-step -step of the calculation, but it's not telling the client anything. I'm, I'm keen to hear your your view and and, and even, I mean, I mean, maybe the, um, like, uh, the Alpha Association and that, like, what is the view? Like, what are you, what are you like, sort of promoting with client, of, with advisors and saying, this is what you need to do and this is what you need to, and this is how you need to, to use it to your and your client's benefit. I, I, I like that question because it, it relates to what should advisors do to really still continue keeping the client on track. And uh, one, one of the things that is always a good reminder for me is that um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that is important because at the end of the day, if, if me as a financial planner, I'm going to go and revisit my client and having done an analysis or it's review stage and I've pulled this nice, beautiful, long report, but I don't make that report aligned to what is happening in their finances or in their lives currently um, relevant to them, then I'm already really not making any sense. I'm not making any sense. I'm talking finances. I'm talking financial planning. I'm talking advice processes. I'm talking solutions and recommendations, but I'm really not making sense to what is necessary for them in that particular you know, phase of their financial journey. So I, I do think it's very important that financial planners always remember that clients out there know that you know best when it comes to that 
you know, field, just like they will go see a doctor, a dentist, whatever it is, you know, a heart surgeon, they are trusting that you already know what you know, but make it applicable to me, make that conversation help me be like, I really understand what you're saying, where you're going with it, and where all of this really fits. And I think one of the things that Louis said is that you from a from from a tool you are always able to pull a summary you are always able to make a selection of the relevant things that you're going to be having a discussion with that particular client on on that particular day you don't need to go into everything else it doesn't need to look like a bank statement you know um and i think what is also important, I think I've also mentioned it already earlier, to say, make it relevant to the client. And I think what is required from that conversation, it means you really need to be aware of what the client told you. You really need to be aware of how the client prioritizes certain information that they've actually shared with you. Because now you can't come and sit with me and talk, I know somebody asked about estate planning, and talk estate planning when you can already tell, and I know for sure, that my finances right now are not okay. I'm really ready to start sorting things out. I'm ready to take care of my risk planning side of things for the benefit of my beneficiaries. I'm ready to start looking into my saving solutions, be it as for retirement purposes, it's for my child's education plans, whatever the case may be. Make it relevant to me now. Help me prioritize my financial journey in such a manner that in two, three, four years' time, I'm able to sit down with you and make sense of why are we now at a state planning conversation. I think certain things are not necessary at certain moments in that financial journey, but I think it's very smart and it means a lot to a client when they understand that you understand what matters to them right now. Yeah, and I want to. I wish so wish Mariette that I had you on here. So I want to have this the conversation with you because we've had this conversation a few times before. Um, Mariette says that the one pages are the answer, easy to understand. What is not so easy is to create those one pages, to design them, and to know what should be on there and not to make it cluttered. I think that is the challenge. So if anybody has any great one pages you know what, share them, like, unless you feel like this is really your competitive edge. Um, but definitely, do, you, do any of you maybe just let us know in the chat, do you use one pages? Have you designed your own one pages? And, and how are they working for you? So definitely a great one, Mariette, is just designing those is a is that that takes some skill. So it takes time to 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 get that done. Um, Russell, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I, I actually want to add um, something that I've been doing lately. And like Mariette says, and Francois, you also mentioned, it's it's easier said than done, but it definitely is kind of the way to go. And I think even coming out of COVID when you're not working virtually, is that what I also have been doing, not only just in sending, you know, meeting summaries or feedback, or I guess we call it minutes after every meeting with a client, but also when we do implement to help a client make a decision, is in simplicity, say, right, a client wants to see in basic means of like what was my before picture before i came to you and asked for advice and mm. what is my after picture you know so then when i see okay because i've seen i've sought your advice now my situation has improved by so much and i think that's what what clients want because the moment i started doing that since a few months ago um it's been so much more valuable for the client than just pumping out a 10 page or five page report because now they know the benefits of you know, making informed decisions and utilizing or taking my advice and how much it's improved their situation compared to before. So I think look at it from that aspect of like a client seeing it from the point of my before picture versus after my picture, after seeing you or asking you for advice, you know, and I think that's what we also need to incorporate with our, a lot of our processes and our advice giving to clients. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to get into just see there are a couple of questions here and there that we have not addressed as we have gone through. So I, I did just want to run through and just make sure that that maybe we, we give people more value and, and just make sure that we answer some of some of these questions. Um, I seen here one was on, uh, well, Mark was asking to touch on the reporting. I think we've we've sort of done that. Uh, and there's always two ways to go about it. So it's either using the report as it comes out and then adding something to that or just using the numbers from your analysis and do your own report or have some form of integration of some of both of these and, and see how you can make that easy for yourself. Um, but also Adrian is asking about estate planning tools. 
Um, and here we're not talking about like I, I just want to distinguish you and Adrian you can you can correct me if I if I'm misunderstanding you but there is a massive difference between estate planning tools and just doing a risk analysis they are not the same thing okay so, so in my mind I don't know if you agree or disagree so I'm going to switch on all your mics um, so that you can all all have a, a discussion here Russell just uh, unmute yourself um, so yeah, I don't know. What planning tools? Are you using the same tool for all of this? Or do you start off simple and then later on move that way? Do you tend to do estate planning early on or only later in life foot lines? Like what, what do you do? So, so Louis, let me start with you. I think estate planning, you know, is really important. As soon as the client has multiple entities, as soon as there are trusts, as soon as, you know, there are, are different beneficiaries, maybe someone other than a spouse, We've used Momentum's fulcrum tool in our business. It is really good in terms of giving you very accurate reports in terms of the information. A little bit of a drawback that it's only Windows-based and you still have to install that. But we haven't found an alternative that works as well when you purely look at you know, estate liquidity. But at the same time, I would say that is probably the time that you have to bring in a fiduciary specialist. Someone that has a legal background, someone that has, you know, experience understanding the complexities of how that fits into the financial plan. For some people, that might be the financial advisor themselves, but we've rather tried to partner with that client's attorney and, and show them, you know, the information that comes from the state liquidity calculation, but then also put context to, you know, what that information means. Amanda, in your world, like... I think um, I, I know Russell, men oh, sorry, Louis mentioned more around, you know, it depends on the client you're dealing with at the time. And you might find that estate planning is important to really have a discussion on right now. So I'll really touch on the point where maybe it's not really taking place right now. So we within the business um, have something called a, a personal financial organizer. And I think every advisor uses that, but in different ways, whether it's in a digital format or it's you know on, on paper in a file. Um, and in there, we really recommend that advisors continue that everything they possibly do offer and every partner they have that helps them get their clients to the next place, even if they're not estate planning specialists, who are you partnered up with that helps you take care of that for your clients? It must still continue to be part of your personal financial organizer for that client. And we talk a lot about a future pacing a relationship with the client. And what that means is that a client is able to really look at their personal financial organizer and understand that, okay, cool. So Louis has implemented A, B, and C for me. I see there's so many other things that sit in this organizer, but I personally have nothing there of my own. What is it all about? A client is able that next time they sit with you, they are able to actually talk a bit more about other things they've had sight of that might have not been applicable to them at that time. And I mean, I think it's advisors for, um, I mean, I think it's important for advisors to be okay with what we call permission marketing. That is part of permission marketing. That is an opportunity for you to really position yourself as somebody who does attend to all of these different aspects of financial planning, even if it wasn't relevant to the client at that particular time. It's part of servicing. It's part of opening up opportunities. Yeah, awesome. And I, I love that because like, yeah, just always have something like, yeah, there's, there's, there's some companies that are very good with that. They they show you still don't have this with us. So, mm. so you can sort of take that concept and, and also use that. Um, Russell, just very briefly, like uh, when it comes to estate planning, do you follow the same same approach or do you have a different approach? Yeah, so I think a lot of us, you know, make a mistake of also assuming that, you know, we only need to do estate planning when a client gets, you know, a massive estate or they start accumulating massive assets. So, and also I find a lot of clients tend to not know what an estate plan. They think generally a trust, an estate plan and a will is exactly the same thing. And when in actual fact, they're just thinking about a will that says who gets what if they pass away. So I think what I do, especially with all clients, even in the first meeting, even if it's a client with really hardly any assets, I explain to them what the difference is and why it's important to have a will and an estate plan and the difference between the both. So that at least you planting that seed in the client's mind of like, okay, if I start gathering assets, I need to be aware that there are certain things I need to discuss with Russell. 
And that adds to us as advisors of having that ongoing relationship, because like we've mentioned in the first webinar, you know, following all these steps and all these tools, it's not a one-time thing with a client. You're there to walk with the client throughout their whole life as they go through different phases of their life. And coming back to the estate planning tools and I would say working out liquidity costs, first and foremost, I think Capital Legacy has a pretty good, decent tool, you know, for working out estate costs and fees upon death. And even if the client's not taking a legacy protection plan with them, their tool is pretty good for most advisors and we have full access to it. So it's a good one pager in a sense to show a client of like, okay, these are all your costs upon death. Because a lot of times, kid you not, most of my clients are anything, oh, the only cost I have to worry about is my funeral costs. But then they don't think about taxes. Oh, if I have a property or a house, there's conveyancing and transfer attorney fees, all of these costs that they aren't aware of. And it's just, again, making the client aware of that. And then when, in my practice, when we actually go to more detailed estate planning, we also use Momentum's Fulcrum because it goes more detailed and it has a little bit more um, ability for complexities. And then we also do have an attorney um, in our team as well. So that if a client doesn't have an attorney that they've been working with and they have, you know, their estate gets quite complex, like they've got trusts, they've got businesses and other entities, then we can add that aspect and advise them from that point of say, okay, this is what you need to talk about or what we need to review because then it becomes more important about succession planning as well. Awesome. All right. So that was a very interesting discussion. I'm going to bring on Seema Nyker. Uh, I'm going to bring her back uh, for Seema to close the session for us uh, from my side. Thank you very much. France, for um, a very wonderful discussion that we've had today. A reminder uh, for all of you that are watching, um, your CPD hours will be available once you complete your assessment on the learning portal. Uh, look at our communication on our final session where we will be discussing step five and six. So we will uh, put out an advert on our social media, on the FBI social media. Uh, we will send you an email. And yeah, and I think that we can call it a wrap. Thank you again to all the members of the working committee to make the session possible today. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you. Cheers, everyone.